When I got to play Avatar a month before launch, this is what I said. I don't even know if I want to review this game. I don't know if I want a free copy to play. It didn't really convince me that I want to spend more than I just spent on it in the demo. Hey, what happened? Let's just say I've been going through a phase creatively and it made sense in my head to go ahead and review this game when I got the opportunity, so I did. The title of that preview video was Avatar is basically Far Cry with blue people. And after finishing the main game, yeah, that's exactly how I feel. Thanks to Ubisoft for the code. Avatar is an absurdly gorgeous video game, and blowing stuff up is genuinely fun. But I couldn't shake the feeling that I've played this game before. You know that famous Voss line about the definition of insanity, which was in the game that Ubisoft continues to use the same formula of more than a decade later? With Avatar, Ubi is doing the same thing over and over and over again and expecting different results. Or maybe they're just fine making 7 out of 10 games if they sell well enough. I'm calling this a Far Cry game because, well, it is in all but name. Avatar is a first-person action game set in an open world where you blow up outposts, you collect ingredients for crafting, you hunt down animals for their parts, and you clear out a giant map with tons of markers on it. You work through a skill tree. There is a gear level system and a story told through set pieces and extended dialogue cutscenes. If you play UB games, that should sound familiar because we've been playing different versions of this same formula since Far Cry 3. I know I sound annoyed, that's because I do play almost every single Ubisoft game, but I don't think this is inherently a bad thing. Your little cousin who loves Avatar is not going to think about how similar it is to a game that came out before he was born. What does separate Avatar from Far Cry though is its setting. Pandora is far more interesting visually than any Far Cry game. This is owing to the fact that we're on an alien planet, of course, which is full of lush forests and floating rock islands. Not only is it great to look at from a distance, but you can walk up really close and just see how insane the detail is. It's not one of those empty open world video games, it's, it's very dense. The game's three zones feel distinct and recognizable. In the Kinglore Forest, vegetation runs wild and roots hang in the air to guide you through the trees. The Upper Plains is stark by comparison with huge sweeping valleys and wind-whipped canyons. The Cloud Forest is a foggy undergrowth dotted with mushrooms and misty treetops. It's a visual feast for the eyes and I couldn't help but appreciate it. In my preview I mentioned there might be a meditative aspect to gathering plants and hunting in this world and Yes, there absolutely is. I felt one with nature, like the other Ron from Parks and Rec, just wandering around and appreciating what I was seeing. It's hard not to look at this open world and say, yeah, it is one of the prettiest we've seen. But I learned this lesson the hard way with Assassin's Creed Valhalla, graphics are not everything for me. It was hard to fully lose myself in this world because of so many of Ubisoft's design choices. The biggest offender for me is level gating. This game has a gear score system where it adds up every piece to give you an overall strength. And each quest that you come across has a certain level to tell you whether or not you're ready to handle it. The problem is this level jumps up frequently and seemingly randomly, and there's no guarantee that you'll get an upgrade during the quest you're on. The idea here is to force you to engage with the crafting system or do side content, but I found this to be frustrating more than anything. In the middle of an important story arc, I'd finish one mission, get ready to go to the next, but then bam, somehow it's two levels higher. This happened to me a handful of times, and that was more than enough to get on my nerves. It forced me to go engage with content that I wasn't choosing to play, I wasn't in the mood for it. In an open world game, where the whole point is to let you do what you want to when you want to do it. And you could say, look, this is not a linear video game, it's going to have progression systems like this, so you just have to deal with it. It just didn't really make sense for this video game to me. In Red Dead Redemption 2, you don't walk up to a story mission that tells you, sorry, Arthur doesn't have the required gear, you just play it. In Avatar, it knocks you over the head and says, go do other stuff, you little baby. You have no idea what you're doing, you stupid dumb baby. If you couldn't tell, there's something that really bothers me about a game telling me I'm not ready to do something because of an arbitrary number that they decided. 
especially when it's just going to talk to an NPC to start the mission. There's not even enemies. Like, I don't need to be two levels higher to talk to a specific Navi. Speaking of story, you play as a member of the Sarantu, a once lost tribe whose specialty is diplomacy. It's your job to visit each tribe and recruit them to fight the RDA and save Pandora. It's pretty much what you would expect. Honestly, I did enjoy the story at times, especially when I met each of the tribes and was introduced to a new part of the world. There's some breathtaking step out moments thanks to the world design that genuinely like took me by surprise. But somewhere along the way, I just checked out mentally. Maybe it was the level gating that was getting on my nerves or the fact that I'm not exactly an Avatar fan. Don't get me wrong, there's some twists and some turns, betrayals and epiphanies, but it didn't grab me and hold my attention. As far as characters, there's plenty of interesting Navi that you get to talk to and learn more about. They feel appropriately serious and they understand the weight of the situation with the RDA. And then there's Priya, this really chatty human who ruins it. Uh, what? Knock, knock. Priya, what are you doing? Water who? Water, you doing telling jokes. Don't you have more important things to do? <laughs> the worst part is she'll radio you between missions, unprompted, while you're just exploring. I felt like her captive audience, and every time she talked, Bruh. I felt like I cringed out of my body. This is another one of those things that I should have just expected, because man, Yubi has such a knack for writing these unlikable characters, it's almost a requirement at this point. I am clearly not the target audience. The cutscene quality is also familiar for me. In the really important story beats, you'll get a big boy scene where the motion capture is impressive and it actually commands your attention. But most of the time, you're getting this. I'm not sure who to talk to about this. I don't know how... Ah, maybe I shouldn't say anything. These are some of the worst looking humans I can remember in a Yubi game. I mean, they look really bad. It's another one of those things that just yanked me out of the game and it just reminded me in my brain like it clicked. This is the Ubisoft formula. They shoot for quantity over quality and each time I just think it takes away from the experience. Especially considering the main story is not very long. It's like 15 to 20 hours maybe. And the kicker is even though the story is pretty short I would say, there are too many cutscenes for me. If you love Avatar, then this probably won't be on your radar because there's enough going on here to carry you forward. But so often I felt locked into these first person cutscenes, just like waiting for them to finish yapping so I could go back into the world. As a Navi, you can use several different types of bows. You've got the long range heavy bow, the medium range longbow, and the quick fire shortbow. You also get something called a spear thrower, which pierces through armor at close range, and this sling, which you can use to lob bombs and set traps. Each weapon has a special ammo type that costs a decent bit of resources to make, but I found them to be pretty powerful. Bows in general feel heavily inspired by the Horizon games. I mean, you can just put them side by side, you craft from the weapon wheel, you switch ammo, even the types themselves feel similar. I guess that's not the worst thing in the world because the bow gameplay does feel good and satisfying when you land your shots. Just like the movies, you can pick up and use RDA guns like the assault rifle and the shotgun. These are obviously more boring to use, but I found them to be incredibly effective. I mean, towards the end of the game, I mostly used the shotgun for close range and then switched over to the heavy bow to snipe people from far. Similar to Far Cry, you can go in guns blazing or you can try to do things stealthily. The few times I tried stealth, I got caught pretty quickly, but I'm also super impatient, so I tend to go in firing first. One of the bigger issues I found with stealth and combat in general is not being able to identify enemies. This is a visually noisy video game. There's so many glowing objects and bright colors that it feels overwhelming. Humans are like tiny little ants compared to Navi, so they tend to slip behind cover and get lost unless you spam Navi vision. The amp suits are much easier to spot and you fight a lot of those, but yeah, Navi vision made tracking enemies in combat just difficult for me. 
This was another design choice that I bumped pretty hard into. I mean, I get what UB was going for here with Navi Vision. I mean, these are alien creatures who rely on their senses, so we get kind of an artistic representation of that here. In addition to using it in combat, this is how you find out where your objective is, how you hunt down animals to kill them, how you find plants to harvest. But I found it really frustrating to use. It's just hard to see what you're looking for when you've got this transparent brush stroke over your target instead of a clear outline of what you're looking for. I spent more time spamming this UI button to find things rather than looking for things myself. And you could say that's a me problem, but I think that goes back to the design. It's a problem when so many parts of this game rely on one single system and the system is just not that good. And by the way, I did look for a setting to make this better, like an accessibility menu option to make it less blurry and more obvious, but I couldn't find that. So I hope UB considers adding something like that in a future update. I mentioned in my preview that controlling your character feels a little awkward due to the fact that you're really tall, like much taller than a human. The more I played though, I got used to this and I ended up liking what they did here. You can charge your jump, which gives you control over how long and far you go. Spamming the jump button lets you mantle objects really quickly, so climbing and navigating on foot feels pretty engaging. I mentioned in the preview that I wish you could swing from tree branches and while I still do, I think what's here is still fun, and you can also parkour through treetops if you find the right trees. The movement isn't just good for running around the world though, you can and definitely should use this stuff in combat. In fact, it took me way too long to realize that you can use a directional jump in combat to dodge left, right, and back. I always felt like the Far Cry games would be more fun if there was better movement for your character. We're in Pandora, we've got Navi who are very agile, so it makes sense in this game and there's some really fun tools to use here. You can also ride your Ikrin into battle, which is this dinosaur bird you get pretty early on in the game. I started doing this towards the end of my time with the game and I wish I started it sooner because it's really fun to sort of swoop in, blow stuff up and dodge gunfire. There's also some special skills you can unlock to help you in mounted combat, like blowing people away and things like that, but I never tried them out. That's definitely something I wish I did. Like any self-respecting Far Cry game, Avatar has outposts. These are RDA facilities which are scattered across the landscape and they pollute Pandora. Unfortunately, like the missions, these have level gating, so you can just wander across one of these in the world and get absolutely smashed. Not because you're not good enough, but because your level is too low. The goal for each one is to blow it up by turning valves, hacking computers, and shooting weak points. There's a small variation between them, but once you've done a couple of them, you've seen them all. You can sneak in to do this without anyone knowing or kill everyone and then do it. Of course, I opted for the latter. Once you finish an outpost, you get the classic outpost cutscene and then the land returns to its normal, beautiful self. It heals and you see you know, animals coming back out and the surrounding area is safe again. They do something interesting here where you can't really hunt or harvest materials from the area around the outpost until you clear it. And I think that makes perfect sense for Avatar. But I was disappointed to find that nothing happens to the outposts once you clear them. The Navi don't move in and take over the facilities, they just get reclaimed by nature and they sit there. There's an awful lot of these around the map, and UB has done the thing before where outposts are populated by allies after you clear them. Maybe it's because the Navi wouldn't want to occupy RDA areas, that does make sense, but you do have human allies, so I would have liked to have seen these zones repurposed after you clear them. I mean, something like that would make the world feel more alive and like you have an impact on it. There are plenty of side quests in this game, and even though I was forced to do them because of the level gating, I enjoyed some of what I played. Here's what's called a memory painting, where you have to guide your Navi hands to draw figures. It channels the same kind of energy as the poetry minigame in Ghost of Tsushima or the stone cairns in Assassin's Creed Valhalla. It's a nice change of pace activity, it feels meditative, and these work for me as long as there's not too many and I'm actually enjoying it, I'm not being forced into it. But then you've also got those super dialogue heavy ones with characters that just aren't very interesting and 
At a certain point, yeah, I, I probably due to that level gating, I just started skipping dialogue because it felt like everyone wanted to share their life story with me and it wasn't gripping me. I definitely hit that wall with this game where I was like, okay, let's, let's get it over with. Let's go back to the main mission and finish it. Far Cry has had skill trees since Far Cry 3, so of course, Avatar has to have them too. It's exactly what you'd expect, so there's really not much to discuss here. I will say though that I appreciate them giving out skill points when you complete missions instead of doing a traditional XP bar leveling system. It feels nice to complete a quest and then pop open the skill menu and pick some upgrades instead of the arbitrary leveling system that we might have gotten. Having said that, I really, really despise the way that they did gear in this game. It feels so unnecessary and it's so rooted in the UB formula rather than what actually would make sense for an avatar game. This is your character menu where you equip items in all of the slots and yeah, again, I don't have to explain this because you've seen it before. If your gear is not up to snuff, you get this little exclamation point icon telling you that that piece is not good enough for the current content. Cool, thanks. I gotta be honest, I've never liked the looter aspect of Ubisoft's open world games, at least their recent ones. It's not fun for me to seek out slightly better pieces of gear to satisfy a system that exists because they tried something new for Assassin's Creed Origins back in 2017 and it's stuck around. You might be thinking, well, JV, what would you have done since you're such an armchair game dev and you totally know what would have worked better? Well, I'm glad you asked. This is how I would make open world game loot suck less. This is not just for Avatar, it's for every single game. First off, give me one base version of every weapon. Let me upgrade that base weapon so I actually care about it rather than accumulating 15 copies of the same thing with slightly different stats and then expecting me to upgrade each one only to throw it away 30 minutes later and clog up my inventory in the process. Same thing with armor. I don't need 15 different butt towels. Just give me base gear and let me upgrade it over time. Looting and rarity tiers and menu inventory management is just something that belongs in a game like Diablo 4, you know, a CRPG, not Avatar. This should be an action game First and foremost, not a stat-based RPG slog. The average Avatar enjoyer does not want to spend time optimizing their loadout to overcome a level whatever outpost. I, I'm sorry, they just don't. Basically, I think they should go back to how things were before Origins. Maybe Far Cry 5, you know? Guns are guns. They're not mini loot dopamine hits that you're trying to throw at the player constantly. My Navi doesn't care about the difference between a 170 damage bow versus a 200 damage bow. It's just nonsense. Another UB game that Avatar borrows from is Watch Dogs. Early on, one of the humans gives you a device called a SID, which lets you hack into things. I hope you love hacking, because you're going to be doing a lot of hacking in this game. And the mini game is basically the same as what you do in Watch Dogs. You like click the direction, you gotta unlock certain parts, there's some stuff you gotta avoid. This is another situation where I understand the intent. It makes sense for Navi to interact with RDA devices, but my God, this game mechanic is such a crutch. You're gonna hack like 50 to 100 devices in the main story alone. These mini games get tougher as you move forward, but they're so frequent and so uninspired that I started to resent them even though they only take like half a minute to do. There was a mission in the back half of the story where I'm pretty sure I hacked like six devices in the course of five to 10 minutes. It was insane. And it just left me thinking like, what are we doing here? Who is this for? Like, this is not fun. In a similar vein, there's an investigation mini game that you'll see in the main storyline and side quests. You're asked to connect clues in order to find out what's going on. It's very similar to Assassin's Creed Unity, I really did not like these. It's another part of the game that forces you to deal with the blurry Navi vision. And so I spent so much time looking around for clues that aren't very clear, you can't see well, and then connecting those clues to one another feels very arbitrary. The game will do things like connecting a scratch on the ground to a basin of water on the other side of a camp. And you're like, Bruh. how was I supposed to know those were connected? I ended up brute forcing a lot of these and just, you know, okay, there's eight clues. Let's just click on one and see which one it connects to instead of actually thinking through the activity, you know? 
it made me want to stop and just look up the answers, but then I remembered, oh, there's nothing online because I'm playing this before launch. Like I mentioned near the beginning, the hunting and gathering, while frustrating with Navi Vision, is probably the most fun I had playing Avatar. The world itself is so pretty to look at, and there's something satisfying about wandering through and picking weird alien fruit. There's also a system that rates your picks based on the time of day or weather conditions, so it's not just picking plants, there's some complexity there. The hunting is also fun, it's nice to track down your target, crouch down low, and then land the perfect kill on the weak spot. This stuff isn't new, but hey, at least it represents some intrinsic motivation for me. In other words, these were things I wanted to do on my terms rather than being forced to do by gameplay design choices. This is similar to how I feel about crafting too. Most of the time I wasn't crafting to get the new, cool, more powerful piece of gear. I was doing it to get around the level gating system so I could finally keep playing the content that I wanted to play. Also, they made tracking ingredients pretty tedious for crafting. When you want to search for a specific flora or an animal you need parts from, you're told to go to the hunter's guide and use the clues there in order to track it down. The problem is, at least for me, I kept struggling with the blurry UI to find what I was looking for. I really think this game would benefit from a mini map because it sucks to open and close and open and close the same map a million times to find something. This still sucks. Multiple times when I was in the menus, I accidentally scrolled over to the store and got that instant feeling of Ugh, like yuck, this is disgusting. Also, who in God's name is going to spend $20 for armor that looks slightly different than what's already in the game? The only time you see your character is when you're mounted, which to be fair is more often than a typical Far Cry game, but I don't know, there's a larger discussion to be had about how UB preys on sharks and on children with its stores, but this is just not the time. For now though, this always makes me like a game a little less, and Avatar is no different. A lot of my experience with Avatar can be boiled down to the fact that I would have liked this game more if it wasn't made by Ubisoft. If it didn't rely so heavily on reused mechanics and gameplay systems refashioned for this game. It's not so much that these are the same mechanics, it's that they don't fit Avatar, and they're just not fun for me. It's a shame because this game is absolutely incredible to look at. I mean, if there was ever a video game where you could just spend hours wandering and taking photos in photo mode, this is the one. But it's just not that fun to play. Any sort of flow state that I might have hit gets interrupted by level gating, menu management, and questionable UI decisions. It grows tedious to play instead of letting you experience the game how you want to. At best, Avatar is a beautiful game you can play on a big TV and soak in the environment. At worst, it's a sluggish grind that forces you to give up and just stop playing because you're not having fun. Somewhere out there, there's an alternate universe where the worlds Ubisoft creates are as fun to explore and play in as they look. But unfortunately, this is not that universe, and Avatar is just not that game. In any case, I hope you guys enjoyed this review, and I want to thank UB for letting me share my honest opinions, as always. I mean, I was shocked that they offered me a review code after my preview video, but as long as you're not being a total dick, they welcome constructive criticism better than a lot of companies. If you enjoyed this video, make sure to hit the like button. Also, subscribe to the channel for more videos like this, and ring the bell so you don't miss my next one. Thanks so much for watching, and I will talk to you next time.